Edmund and the Wardrobe Lucy ran out of the empty room into the passage and found the other three. It's all right, she repeated. I've come back. What on earth are you talking about, Lucy? asked Susan. Why, said Lucy in amazement, haven't you all been wondering where I was? So you've been hiding, have you? said Peter. Poor old Lou, hiding and nobody noticed. You'll have to hide longer than that if you want people to start looking for you. But I've been away for hours and hours, said Lucy. The others all stared at one another. Batty, said Edmund, tapping his head. Quite batty. What do you mean, Lou? asked Peter. What I said, answered Lucy. It was just after breakfast when I went into the wardrobe and I'd been away for hours and hours and had tea and all sorts of things have happened. Don't be silly, Lucy, said Susan. We've only just come out of that room a moment ago and you were there then. She's not being silly at all, said Peter. She's just making up a story for fun, aren't you, Lou? And why shouldn't she? No, Peter, I'm not, she said. It's... It's a magic wardrobe. There's a wood inside, and it's snowing, and there's a fawn and a witch, and it's called Narnia. Come and see. The others did not know what to think, but Lucy was so excited that they all went back with her into the room. She rushed ahead of them, flung open the door of the wardrobe, and cried, Now go in and see for yourselves. Why, you goose! said Susan, putting her head inside and pulling the fur coats apart. It's just an ordinary wardrobe. Look, there's the back of it. Then everyone looked in and pulled the coats apart, and they all saw, Lucy herself saw, a perfectly ordinary wardrobe. There was no wood and no snow, only the back of the wardrobe with hooks on it. Peter went in and wrapped his knuckles on it to make sure that it was solid. A jolly good hoax, Lou, he said as he came out again. You've really taken us in, I must admit. We half believed you. But it wasn't a hoax at all, said Lucy. Really and truly, it was all different a moment ago. Honestly, it was, I promise. Come, Lou, said Peter, that's going a bit far. You've had your joke, hadn't you better drop it now? Lucy grew very red in the face and tried to say something, though she hardly knew what she was trying to say, and burst into tears. For the next few days she was very miserable. She could have made it up with the others quite easily at any moment if she could have brought herself to say that the whole thing was only a story made up for fun. But Lucy was a very truthful girl, and she knew that she was really in the right and she could not bring herself to say this. The others, who thought she was telling a lie, and a silly lie too, made her very unhappy. The two elder ones did this without meaning to do it, but Edmund could be spiteful, and on this occasion he was spiteful. He sneered and jeered at Lucy, and kept on asking her if she'd found any other new countries in other cupboards all over the house. What made it worse was that these days ought to have been delightful. The weather was fine, and they were out of doors from morning to night, bathing, fishing, climbing trees, and lying in the heather. But Lucy could not properly enjoy any of it, and so things went on until the next wet day. That day, when it came to the afternoon, and there was still no sign of a break in the weather, they decided to play hide-and-seek. Susan was it, and as soon as the others scattered to hide, Lucy went to the room where the wardrobe was. She did not mean to hide in the wardrobe because she knew that that would only set the others talking again about the whole wretched business. But she did want to have one more look inside it, for by this time she was beginning to wonder herself whether Narnia and the Fawn had not been a dream. The house was so large and complicated and full of hiding places that she thought she would have time to have one look into the wardrobe and then hide somewhere else. 
but as soon as she reached it, she heard steps in the passage outside, and then there was nothing for it but to jump into the wardrobe and hold the door closed behind her. She did not shut it properly, because she knew that it is very silly to shut oneself into a wardrobe, even if it is not a magic one. Now the steps she had heard were those of Edmund, and he came into the room just in time to see Lucy vanishing into the wardrobe. He at once decided to get into it himself, not because he thought it a particularly good place to hide, but because he wanted to go on teasing her about her imaginary country. He opened the door. There were the coats hanging up as usual, and a smell of mothballs, and darkness and silence. And no sign of Lucy. She thinks I'm Susan come to catch her, said Edmund to himself, and so she's keeping very quiet in at the back. He jumped in and shut the door, forgetting what a very foolish thing this is to do. Then he began feeling about for Lucy in the dark. He had expected to find her in a few seconds, and was very surprised when he did not. He decided to open the door again. And let in some light, but he could not find the door either. He didn't like this at all, and began groping wildly in every direction. He even shouted out, "Lucy, Lou, where are you? I know you're here." There was no answer, and Edmund noticed that his own voice had a curious sound—not the sound you expect in a cupboard, but a kind of open air sound. He also noticed that he was unexpectedly cold. And then he saw a light. Thank goodness," said Edmund. "The door must have swung open of its own accord." He forgot all about Lucy and went toward the light, which he thought was the open door of the wardrobe. But instead of finding himself stepping out into the spare room, he found himself stepping out from the shadow of some thick, dark fir trees into an open place in the middle of a wood. There was crisp, dry snow under his feet, and more snow lying on the branches of the trees. Overhead, there was a pale blue sky, the sort of sky one sees on a fine winter day in the morning. Straight ahead of him, he saw between the tree trunks the sun just rising, very red and clear. Everything was perfectly still, as if he were the only living creature in that country. There was not even a robin or a squirrel among the trees, and the wood stretched as far as he could see in every direction. He shivered. He now remembered that he had been looking for Lucy, and also how unpleasant he had been to her about her imaginary country, which now turned out not to have been imaginary at all. He thought that she must be somewhere quite close, and so he shouted, "Lucy!" Lucy, I am here too, Edmund. There was no answer. She's angry about all the things I've been saying lately, thought Edmund, and though he did not like to admit that he had been wrong, he also did not much like being alone in this strange, cold, quiet place. So he shouted again. I say, Lou, I'm sorry I didn't believe you. I see now you were right all along. Do come out, make it pax. Still, there was no answer. Just like a girl," said Edmund to himself, sulking somewhere and won't accept an apology. He looked round him again, and decided he did not much like this place, and had almost made up his mind to go home when he heard, very far off in the wood. A sound of bells. He listened, and the sound came nearer and nearer. And at last, there swept into sight a sledge drawn by two reindeer. The reindeer were about the size of Shetland ponies, and their hair was so white that even the snow hardly looked white compared with them. Their branching horns were gilded and shone like something on fire when the sunrise caught them. Their harness was of scarlet leather and covered with bells. On the sledge driving the reindeer sat a fat dwarf who would have been about three feet high if he had been standing. 
He was dressed in polar bear's fur, and on his head he wore a red hood with a long gold tassel hanging down from its point. His huge beard covered his knees and served him instead of a rug. But behind him, on a much higher seat in the middle of the sledge, sat a very different person, a great lady, taller than any woman that Edmund had ever seen. She also was covered in white fur up to her throat, and held a long straight golden wand in her right hand, and wore a golden crown on her head. Her face was white, not merely pale, but white like snow or paper or icing sugar, except for her very red mouth. It was a beautiful face in other respects, but proud and cold and stern. The sledge was a fine sight. As it came sweeping toward Edmund, with the bells jingling and the dwarf cracking his whip and the snow flying up on each side of it, stop," said the lady, and the dwarf pulled the reindeer up so sharp that they almost sat down. Then they recovered themselves and stood champing their bits and blowing. In the frosty air, the breath coming out of their nostrils looked like smoke. And what, pray, are you?" said the lady, looking hard at Edmund. I'm, I'm, my name's Edmund," said Edmund rather awkwardly. He did not like the way she looked at him. The lady frowned. "Is that how you address a queen?" she asked, looking sterner than ever. "I beg your pardon, your Majesty. I didn't know," said Edmund. "Not know the Queen of Narnia?" cried she. "Ha! You shall know us better hereafter. But I repeat." What are you? Please, your Majesty," said Edmund. "I don't know what you mean. I'm at school. At least I was. It's the holidays now."